So welcome everyone to our Partners in Progress Connect webinar. My name is David Sherwood from EW Nutrition in Australia. Today's webinar is the second in a series of layer focused webinars and our speaker for today is Xavier Abe Bugalde from H&N International. Xavier, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, hello, how are you doing? Thanks Xavier. Also we have with us today as a panelist, Marissa Bell Caballero, Global Technical Manager for Poultry EW Nutrition. Marissa Bell, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and good morning and good afternoon, uh, just in case. Uh, uh, welcome to the webinar. I hope you enjoy our session today. I will be in the background answering some questions. Thanks, Marissa Bell. So what we'll do is after, we'll have Xavier's presentation and then uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So the way to ask questions is use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And after you click on that, you'll be able to type in your questions. And at the, at the Q&A session, we'll attempt to answer all of them live. And any that we can't get around to answering, we will uh, respond by email later on. And also at the end of the webinar, I will, uh, there'll be a poll questionnaire, which will give us some uh, feedback for future webinar. Um, information and that will take about three minutes to complete. So uh, please, uh, if you could fill it out, it would be great. Okay, uh, so Xavier Abe is a veterinarian specialized in animal production. After graduating from the University of Saragossa, Spain in 2004, Xavier worked with the biggest egg producer in Spain as a field veterinarian and was in charge of the company's R&D. After some time, he took on the roles of the production general manager and nutritionist of the company. Xavier joined Novus Europe in 2009 as the technical manager for Spain and Portugal. He was also the poultry and feed hygiene specialist for Novus Europe. In 2012, Xavier was transferred to Novus Southeast Asia Pacific, where he worked as the regional technical manager. And since October 2015, he, is, he worked as head of technical services for Novus Southeast Asia and South Asia Pacific. Since 1st of July 2017, he is working as Global Nutritionist for H&N International GmbH, based in Bangkok, supporting customers around the world. Since October 2019, he took the additional role of Business Unit Manager to develop a new phase on the path of H&N International GmbH worldwide. Xavier, please start your presentation. Thank you, David. Uh, first, I want to thank you, uh, EW Nutrition, to inviting me uh, to this webinar. So, further ado, I'm going to start my presentation about how we can try to keep the birds as long as possible in the production. And we know one thing that is very clear is that uh, the genetic improvement of these last years has impacted the longevity of the hens. I still remember when I was uh, finishing, uh, when still in production, that uh, we were culling the birds around 70 to 75 weeks of age. But nowadays, when I visited customers around the world, you can see that that number has shifted to be more around the 85, 90 weeks. And this is something that is already happening, but I want to show you something that is also coming in the future. Here I want to show you some of our in-house data of our uh, pure lines of uh, the, our white hen uh, Nick Chick. What you can see here is in gray, you have the standards. And now what we can see is that the pure lines of the flocks, there's no much improvement here at the, the beginning of the production, but the big improvement is coming and is going to happen at the end, at the late production. You can see is that there is a lot, still a lot of room of improvement. And also if we take the best 25% of those pure lines, you can see here is that those hens are still above 90% of production around uh, 95 weeks of age. So this means that right now we are talking about 100 weeks as a, as a goal, but our future genetics, or in general the future genetics, we might be talking about the hen of the 120 weeks. But saying that, how we can uh, work or how we can achieve the 100 weeks of production. Well, as we learned uh, last week in the webinar of Dr. Korber, it's going to be a 
a key element to have a good production, to have a good pullet. A good pullet that means a good body weight, right body weight during the different phases of the, pro of the, of the development of the pullet and at the same time also good uniformity. But today I want, I'm going to focus more on these two factors or just two uh, issues that we have to face to achieve those 100 weeks. It's going to be the start of the production and once we do a good start of the production, how we can sustain that production until 100 weeks. So if we think about at the start of the production, we need to have in mind two targets, the light stimulation and the other one should be is to achieve the target feed intake as soon as possible. The light stimulation is a tool that is very well known in layer production that is going to help us to establish the parameter of what kind of production we are going to have in, in, the, in the layer house. But we have to always remember is that the lighting, lighting stimulation has to be according to the body weight and also we depends on what kind of mar egg weight market we have, we can make different variations. Just a reminder, usually in the guidelines, we have a average or target egg size of, uh, of the hens. If we want to make some modifications on this egg weight, we need to play mainly with the lighting program. Our, our geneticist always hammers us telling us I can change the egg size through genetics one gram, but with the light stimulation, you can change it three grams. So once we have said, we have established what kind of light stimulation we are going to have, and that light stimulation always have to be applied when we, are, when we have the right body weight, the next step should be is to achieve the target feed intake. The target feed intake, I, Everyone can have different target, but I recommend to have some, something is to achieve the 100 grams of daily feed intake as soon as possible. And that also only can be achieved first with the work that we are going to do with the developer feed that we learned last week is the feed that you can give from 10 to 16, 16 weeks of age, 17 weeks of age, where we are going to do is we are going to develop the feed intake capacity. Once we have that feed intake capacity, then there's going to be the onset feed or the start of, of the lay feed. In that case, I'm going to present you today some update and some new approach that I want to share with you. But why this part of the start of the lay is so important? As you can see here, between week 16 and week 21, there's going to be a big growth. What kind of growth? It's going to be, we are going to have an increase of the body weight. We are going to have the sexual maturity where we are going to produce, the hens are going to produce the first egg, but also we are going to have a big development of the bones. There's going to be, we are going to develop the secondary bones and we are going to have additional reserves of the cousin. And also we are going to have some fat development. And in this case, if we want to achieve this second development that is going to be key for the longevity of the hen, we need feed intake. So here we have a little bit the standard of the feed intake through the beginning of the, the last period of time of the rearing and the start of the production. So one of the goals that we have to set up is to try to finish with the highest feed intake possible at 17 weeks. As we mentioned, it's, this is going to be done through the developer feed and then the point is how we can achieve these 100 grams as soon as possible. Because one thing that you have to realize is that if we finish with low feed intake at the rearing, the development of the feed intake is also going to be delayed. And that is going to have an impact on the development, on that second phase of the development, on the production of the first egg. And even if we go through this period of time with usually or not, we don't see much problems. There's something that uh, we will see later that are going to be problems after the peak of the production. This is why our message is to try to get the feed intake, the target feed intake, the 100 grams as soon as possible. 
So the actual approach from the point of view of nutrition is uh, to use the prelay uh, with the different schools. Uh, we saw different approaches. Uh, people recommend to use the prelay until two to five percent of the production. Uh, to use it only for two weeks once uh, you are at 17 weeks. And other also they are recommending one kilogram, 1.5, 1.2 different per bird. So once you give that, you change to the uh, layer production, layer production feed. But also, I mean, after that prelay of those two first weeks, we also go into, we see that people is using high density diets because the main message that we get from the nutritionist and from the field is she doesn't eat enough. So that's why I need to put some kind of high density type of diets. So what is happening, and this is a little bit uh, uh, an approach, is here we have the body weights of the pullets or the target body weights that we have in the period of, of time between the 10th week and the 22 weeks of age. So what, we, what is happening is when we are feeding the developer feed, we are working in the gut size. We are strengthening, we are improving uh, the rate of growth of the gut. In this way, we are preparing to the hen to have that kind of feed intake capacity when it approaches the time to start the production. But if we change the hen to a high density diet because we are scared that she is not going to eat, what we are doing is we are contracting the gut size. We are telling the, the message that we are giving to the hen through this high density diet is, okay, don't worry, you don't need to eat more because I'm already giving you high density diet. So we are pushing against what we have done during the developer time. So this is why I want to introduce this onset feed that is a hybrid concept. What does I mean this hybrid? It's a mix between the developer feed and the layer feed. So from the point of view of that mix, how, how, what, is the con what are the concepts? So we have first is we are going to have a low energy and relatively high levels of fiber that they are going to be uh, mimicking what we have done in the developer feed. In this case, what we are trying to do is we are trying to keep uh, increasing the feed intake capacity. In this way, the, uh, the bird is, not, is going to keep eating. And also we play with a little bit with the levels of, of uh, salt. Layer hens are very sensitive to salt. It's a good stimul, uh, it's a good stimulant, a good stimulant of the feed intake. So in this way, we are going to work in this phase of feed intake capacity. But at the same time, we need to be aware is that we are going to have an additional bond development. We are going to have the first egg. So this is why we are going to have a high amino acid profile in this diet. And at the same time, we are going to put levels of calcium and phosphorus as a uh, layer feed. There is some uh, concerns and there is some literature that uh, if you put high levels of calcium, you might reduce the feed intake. It was like, uh, there's some old articles about it. This is why to avoid this kind of situation and to prevent it, we recommend is that the 60% of the calcium or the 60% of the uh, calcium carbonate of this feed should be coarse particle to avoid some kind of uh, uh, feed intake reduction because of the calcium. So in this way, what we are trying to do is, okay, let's keep stimulating the feed intake of the bird, but at the same time, let her have enough nutrients for that first egg. So how we should use this feed? The use of this feed should be, we should have the feed at the beans before the lighting starts, and we keep it there, giving to the hens until the 70% of lay. I think this is a quite easy, uh, easy friendly uh, recommendation because it's always difficult to make measurements at the farm level, but we know that it's easy to count how many eggs are leaving the farm. 
So we think is that this bear, since before lining until you achieve the 70% of production, is going to give you enough feed intake to capacity to achieve those 100 grams as soon as possible. So I want to share with you some examples. In this case, I, I got some brown birds, but we also have experience with white birds. And as you can see, is what we are doing is we are trying to don't stop the increase of the feed intake so we can achieve those 100 grams as soon as possible. And then we will change to a layer diet where we are going to achieve whatever is the target feed intake that we want. This is for the cage performance. And we also have an example of cage pre-performance. As you can see is here we have the increase of the feed intake as we use this feed. But always is very important in both examples you can see is that we are finishing around 17 weeks with 80 grams or 70 uh, average 80 grams of feed intake. If we have good finish, we can continue with this kind of feed. And after that, we change to the layer feed that is going to give the, 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 the nutrients for continuing the production. Excuse me, Xavier? Yes. Sorry, uh, the sound is a little bit low. The yep. sound is a little bit quiet. Just wondering if it's possible to speak up a little bit louder. Yes, sure. Please, please. yep, thank you. Okay. Sorry. So uh, in the second part, as we said, is we have the start of the production. And then the next part is we have to sustain the production. So the first thing even, it sounds very basics, basics. We have to feed according to the needs. So I will go a little bit through this presentation describing a little bit the needs of the birds due to changes of in the longevity in the production. Also, one of the factors that I think is we have to be aware as we are getting uh, hens for a longer cycles is the oxidative stress. And the next one that we have to take into account is going to be, as always, is going to be the eggshell quality. No matter how many eggs we have to produce, we are going to produce, if we don't have good eggshell, if that's not, it's going to be like we are not doing anything right. So in the actual quality, it's always going to be important to have a balance between calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D that I will discuss a little bit later. So one thing that we have to remember is that the behavior of the lean hens from the point of view of the feed intake is different from the broilers. The broilers, one of the big achievements of the geneticists has been that they are always hungry. However, the hens, they have a different behavior. They eat what they need. Due to the genetic selection, one of the things that we have seen is that now the hens, they are more specialized on egg production, so they are not into meat. So one of the things, one of the shifts is that the hen eats what she needs. So. If we go deep of what happens in our flocks, if we are feeding the typical standard layer feed that we usually see in the market that is 2,750 kilocalories, if we give it to a flock, in that flock, we are going to have hens of different body weight. And those hens, they are going to have different requirements based on the body weight and production. But setting that all of them, all these hens, they are going to produce one egg per day more or less the, the, the needs that they will have is going to be in these numbers. So for that set feed of 2,750 kilocalories, there's going to be a different behavior among the hens to achieve all the kilocalories that they need. Because the main driver of the hen is going to be the kilocalorie intake. So from the point of view of the information that we are going to get in the farm is that the average feed intake is going to be 115 grams. And we are going to make a diet based on 115 grams. But then inside of the flock, we are going to have different behavior. And this is something that we have to be aware, especially if we go to the cage-free productions. And as we are mentioning is that the energy is going to be the first feed intake motivation. From that point of view, here you have an example that for a same egg production mass, the main driver for the feed intake is going to be the body weight. We have white wires and brown bears. They are going to have very similar effect. But as you can see is that it's going to be the main driver 
of the energy needs and the main driver of the feed intake is going to be the body weight. Why I want to highlight this one? Because we all know is that when we have pullets from different seasons, we also, we tend to have birds that they have a different body weight. So we know is that the, the readings that they have, they have finished in summer, they tend to be a little bit lighter. And the ones in winter, they tend to be a little bit heavier. So within the same genetic, the same parent stock uh, production, you are going to have a little differences in the feed intake just for the body weight of the birds. Just 50 grams of body weight difference is going to be a, a difference of four kilocalories per day among the birds. So this is something that we need to be aware of. And it's important that when we make our uh, feed for the layers to understand what is the body weight that we are getting in the bar. It's true that the body weight is going to be one of the drivers, but also we have to remember is that there's going to be a limitation of the temperature. There's always going to be a sweet spot, a thermoneutral uh, range of temperature that is going to be between 20 to 25 degrees, where the bird is going to be feel comfortable. But we have to realize is that as the temperature increases, we are going to have a reduction of the feed intake and also energy reduction. And as the temperature increases, those birds are also going to eat more. They are going to eat more because they have higher needs of production. But in the case that we go to lower temperatures or to higher temperatures, what we can see here is that we are going to have also higher needs of maintenance and lower energy intake. So that is going to be a struggle for the production. So it's good to understand how much is the energy that the birds needs, but also we need to understand is that the temperature is going to play a role in the feeding tick that we are going to have in the bar. If we put the whole needs of the bird through the whole production life in here in a short way, is we can see is that, okay, at the beginning we have seen at the beginning of this presentation that we are going to have uh, 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 some growth needs at the beginning of the production, but most of it, of the energy intake that the birds have, it goes for maintenance and for growth. And maintenance is going to be 60% and is going to be driven by the body weight of the, of the hens and the rest, whatever it is left, it goes for the egg mass production. And remember, egg mass production. And why I'm talking about egg mass production? Because once upon a time, there were two flocks. More or less, the percentage of production was pretty similar. However, the blue flock was having a little bit better number of eggs at the end of the production. But the gray flock was giving more egg size. So if we check the egg mass that it was produced by this flock, we see that the gray flock was giving more mass than the yellow one. So what kind of feed we are going to give? What kind of feed we should give? So one thing that we have to remember is that the layers don't lay number of eggs. The layers have a potential of kilograms of eggs and that is going to be related to the number of eggs and the excess that we want. Probably our, uh, the attendees from Pakistan, they will say, I'm not interested in egg size. I want to have as many eggs as possible. And our attendees from uh, Spain will think about, I want to have big number of egg size. At the end, the limiting factor is going to be the kilograms of eggs. And this, how can we manage those kilograms of eggs is going to be through lighting program and through nutrition. But this important is that with the same hand, we can push for a number of eggs or we can push for the egg size, but we need to realize is if we, we need to have both informations 
to understand how much we are squeezing the genetic potential. And based on that, try to make the correct decision from the point of view of nutrition, management, and other aspects of the production. From the nutrition side, if we put together uh, the needs, what we can see again is that the picture here has changed a little bit and we see that the maintenance needs for amino acids is going to be low. In this case, is an example of digestible lysine, but most of the amino acids, almost 80% of the amino acids, it goes for the egg mass production. So knowing that egg mass production is going to be driven by the amino acids, if we want to control the egg size once we achieve our target egg size that the market is requirement, our recommendation is to control that egg size through the control of the amount of amino acids or protein that you are going to give to the birds. As you can see in example, what we do is we have to control that the fat stays stable, we reduce the amount of protein, and what we are going to modify significantly is going to be the size of the eggs. And this is something that now more and more uh, the market is demanding some kind of type of size of eggs. Once you achieve it, you don't really want to push harder to go up. So once you achieve that, in the way of controlling that is to touch the amount of amino acid that we are giving to the bird. And in this way, we can control uh, the excess. And again, we are talking about feeding the birds what they need. So if we put them in perspective, if we put both mainly needs, in this case, I'm using the energy and the, as a reference, the milligrams of digestible lysine, we can see is that the energy needs are very steady. They don't change much. Why? Because it depends on the body weight of the bird as we have seen. But here comes the big change due to the longevity of the hen. Look at the amino acids needs. And here in this example, we have the needs of milligrams of digestible lysine at 31 weeks and 53. The needs at 53 weeks are higher than at the peak of the production. Why is happening this? Yes, probably at 31 weeks, we are going to have 98, 97% of production, but the egg is still relatively small. When we go to 30, uh, 53 weeks, the percentage of production is going to be above 90% and the egg size also is going to be big. So the egg mass at this moment is higher. But what is happening usually in, in our uh, industry? We tend to keep using the same feeding strategies as those birds of 2010, when at 50 weeks they were starting getting not very healthy, the eggshell was not working, the production was going down. So we were changing the feed quite quickly and in a different, in a, in a manner that now is not appropriate for those birds. So if we use the numbers of the previous slide, we have that at 31 weeks, we have a needs of a digestible lysine of 848. Our feed has 0.75 of digestible lining, uh, lysine. So what we can see is that that bird to match the requirements that she needs for producing the egg mass that she's giving, she's going to eat 113 grams. If we continue with the same appro uh, approach that, okay, what was typical? Around 45, 50 weeks, it's time to change to layer two. Okay, and what was the characteristics of those layer two? We tend to change a little, we increase a little bit the calcium, we reduce the phosphorus, and let's reduce a little bit the protein and sometimes even the energy. But that bird, if we let her express, she has a need because of the egg mass that she's giving to us of 854 milligrams. If we give a, this layer two diet of 0.71, that bird needs to increase the feed intake up to 120 grams per day. Is it possible in a brown bird? Yes, it is. But it's only going to happen as long as we have the good environmental conditions and housing condition. And also that is not summer. 
and also that is not open house and it's also that is not cage free so if this bear is not able to compensate our reduction of the feed in the, of of the of reduction of the specifications of the feed what we what she's going to to do is to drop the body weight because she is going to compensate whatever is not in the feed with her reserves also can happen that she's going to lose feathers because some of the amino acids are not balanced also one of the things that we will see more and more often especially after 50 weeks is we have an increase of a specific mortality it's a mortality that uh, it's not going to be a spectacular number. It's something that we will see that after 50 weeks, we were going to have a higher mortality of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and that one, it will increase. And we will see that there is no clear symptoms and uh, clear, clear diagnosis uh, by the veterinary. And at the end, what we are going to see because of these quick changes that they are not according to the, what the birds need, we are going to have a loss of the production. So this is why we were, I was mentioning is if we want to sustain the production as long as possible, we need to make a formulation based on body weight and egg mass. And once we have clear what are the needs of the bird, depending on the egg mass that our birds are producing, then later on, I can adjust my, new, my amino acid profile, energy profile to a target feed intake based always on the feed intake capacity and the environment condition and housing condition. And another part that I think is going to be key in the future is this unspecific mortality that we think is quite related with the oxidative stress. We know that this mortality, as I was mentioning, it starts around 50 to 50 weeks. And we know also is that the oxidative stress has an effect of accumulative effect. This uh, mortality and specific mortality we tend to see in high productive layers and we also know is that when you have a high productive layer it means that you have a high metabolic rate birds that they are going to produce more free radicals that they are going to be the ones producing oxidative stress. Also we have seen is that uh, an increase of the unspecific mortality when these birds are uh, eating feed where the sulfur amino acid lacing ratio it, it's around 80 to 85 and also uh, in diets where we've been trying to control the egg size with lowering the methionine level ratio we know is that from the antioxidant system that our uh, the hen's body has and also our body glutathione enzyme is one of the key enzymes in the control of the oxidative stress and this enzyme is cysteine independent and also one thing that we have seen is that this and specific mortality, it will increase, especially in open houses or cage-free production that they are more exposed to heat stress and diseases that we know that they are going to increase the factors of oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is quite a complex uh, event that uh, we have an antioxidant system and the hence they can work very uh, well with this antioxidant system but we need to remember that is that we are going to have enzymes we are going to have vitamins we are going to have minerals that they are going to be part of this antioxidant system and it's time to probably think about this more carefully because we are going to have an older hen in production and this is something that we need to realize it might have an impact from the point of view of the longevity. And of course, there is no layer talk in production without talking about eggshell quality. And from the point of view of eggshell quality, it's going to be important to have a balance, a balance in nutrition about calcium and phosphorus. We know is that the metabolism of the calcium is going to be controlled by the PTH and the calcitonin, and they are going to drive all the different physiology about the levels of calcium and phosphorus in the blood. Understanding that, one of the things I want to remind in nutrition is that the excess and the deficiencies in nutrition are always bad. We know that when we have a deficiency of phosphorus or deficiency of calcium, we are going to have actual problems, 
but also remind you is that once we go through this hot sweet spot where we know that the right amount of calcium and phosphorus when we go for the excess it's also going to have an impact in the action so saying that let's go a little bit from the point of view of the needs we know that the amount of calcium we tend to recommend higher levels of calcium as the bird head gets old but also one of the things that they want to highlight especially in this presentation is that once we achieve the peak of the production that the growth of the bird is satisfied and everything is there settled down the amount of calcium is going to the amount of phosphorus is needed is going to be lower and lower so just put it in perspective is right now due to the uh, high productivity of the hens and the longevity the needs of production of the hens they don't really change significantly from the point of view of energy and amino acids until 55 60 weeks of age but what it really changes is going to be the phosphorus and calcium needs so nowadays you can find yourself is that your layer two and your layer layer one and layer two are not different from the energy and amino acid point of view and the only difference is going to be the calcium and phosphorus but also when we are talking about sources and of how we can give this calcium to the hands we have to think is we always have to think about fine particle and coarse particles of the calcium carbonate as the hand gets older it's going to be important to have more and more particles coarse particle size for us in our opinion the coarse particle would be an average of 3.5 millimeters that that's going to have a slower release of the calcium and especially while the higher when, while the needs of the calcium are high this type of calcium is going to have a slower release of the calcium so the hands can have enough calcium at that moment but also i want to highlight the fine particles I want to encourage you to don't use the fine particle that tend to be used in this kind of, uh, I would say this is the broiler diets, that powder, baby type of baby powder type of calcium that really the hands don't like. Remember, the layer hands are very picky about eating and they are mainly, they eat based on particle size. So for the fine particle, I would encourage you to try to find one millimeter average type of particle size it will reduce the dustiness of the feed but also it will improve probably the recovery and the actual quality but when we think about or when we say is that we want a bigger particle size as i mentioned is we are looking for a slow release of the calcium and with that the slow release what we are trying is we want to have this kind of chart okay so here we have two particle size so the biggest particle size is given a slower release than the smaller particle size but we have to realize is that that not always happens not always the coarse particle means the right source for the hen because there are different qualities from the point of view of solubility of the calcium carbonates so in this case you can see an example is like the biggest particle size it doesn't it behaves like a solubility of a fine particle so as part of your quality controls it's always important to control your calcium calcium carbonate supplier and try to see how they are doing about the solubility because we know that particle size is something that you have to work but solubility is something that we have to also start working on it and when we are talking about eggshell quality and uh, how we can help in this uh, critical part of the egg production we have to remember is that the growth or the production of the eggshell it happens almost through uh, the whole night of the or when they when we have to turn off the lights so how we can help uh, during this period of time we have said through the particle size but also 
one of the things that we can help in this actual improvement is going to be with the midnight snack. We know that midnight snack is going to be important, especially to give some feeding. We are going to have some additional feed intake, but remember, we have to offer light, water, and feed. And the calcium needs are going to be high when we are applying this midnight snack. So, of course, we need to offer that feed, but also remember, if you are offering also calcium in water, could be another way of offering a quick solution of calcium when the needs of calcium are high during this period of time that is quite critical for the eggshell formation. So, as a summary, we have uh, long lasting layers that, of course, as we always need, we always need, we are always going to need a good pullet. But once we have that good pullet, we need to have a good start that is going to be based on a quick increase of the feed intake. If we don't have that feed intake, we are not going to have a good start. And then once we go through that period of time, we have to sustain the production with a formulation based on body weight and egg mass. Remember, it's not only the number of eggs, it's also the size of eggs that you are producing, what is going to determine the needs of the bird. And of course, when we go from the point of view of eggshell needs, it's always going to be a balance. No excess, no deficiencies. And of course, we need to think about the right resources of calcium and phosphorus that they are going to give us the balance in our nutrition. So, David, if you want to read some questions, so. Yes, thank you, Xavier, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, as you've uh, highlighted there, the, the birds can lay for longer and longer as time goes by with uh, advances in genetics, but uh, yeah, short sure, quality is one area. They always will need help uh, as uh, they're trying to lay for longer. So uh, thanks very much for that. Um, very interesting for everybody attending. So we do have uh, quite a few questions to go through with, uh, with yourself and Marissa Bell. Sure. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm trying to uh, put my camera again. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there are very interesting questions already in the panel. I would like uh, to out oh, here is yes, yes, you. Um, so I would like to start uh, answering one about uh, oxidative stress. I really like the topic. Uh, so how can we decrease oxidative stress and can essential oils have a role to decrease oxidative stress? Well, um, first, uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, the first way, uh, that uh, we should take to decrease oxidative stress is to avoid it. Um, of course, there is always an amount of oxidative stress uh, happening in any organism, um, but as we avoid additional stress in animals, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, manage well heat stress, uh, like uh, avoid um, uh, other uh, sources uh, that uh, the animals can, uh, uh, can have as a stress, like uh, disease, uh, like um, um, unbalanced uh, diets, uh, a very high stocking density, and so on. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, the animal is better able to cope uh, with the environment. Of course, we will not reduce it to zero. So we need uh, uh, to, to use uh, a certain, uh, let's say, um, uh, weapons uh, to fight oxidative stress. Um, natural antioxidants are one of them and uh, are one that is very effective, but also nutri nutritional antioxidants are as well uh, recommended. Uh, so you can even uh, think about a combination of both of them. Uh, as we know, vitamin E is uh, one of the most uh, uh, powerful um, uh, uh, antioxidative anti uh, substances uh, that uh, uh, that uh, we know as well uh, with vitamin C. So a strategy that includes uh, this both uh, plus 
uh, essential uh, oils or phytomolecules uh, would be highly recommended. Uh, which phytomolecules can aid uh, with uh, oxidative stress? Where well, there, there are many, uh, silymarin is one of them, uh, for example. Um, we know uh, that Cineol uh, uh, has a very uh, powerful antioxidative uh, uh, powers. Um, we know also about uh, Carbacrol, and uh, we know also about grapes and uh, grapefruit-derived uh, antioxidants. So uh, that, uh, to start with oxidative stress, uh, there are other questions. Uh, so, uh, Xavier, maybe you can pick one. Yeah, um, he's asking about the hybrid feed. Uh, why the 0.28 of uh, salt in the hybrid feed, uh, the start of lay means 20%, uh, 0.28 of sodium or salt. So the point is, it's 0.28 of salt. Is uh, to use the same strategy as it is used in those uh, super uh, pre-starters in broilers, that uh, it's recommended to put a lot of salt to stimulate water intake, and that one is going to stimulate also the feed intake. And related to that one also saying is that, is it going to bring uh, water manure? Uh, it's going to have a problem of manure. Look, uh, this feed is going to be used from, as I said, from 17 weeks, let's say a start of lay until 70% of the production. So that means that this feed is not going to be longer than five weeks in the house. By that, I mean, that, that's why it's not going to have a significant effect on manure. And I will say is by the time that someone is complaining, if it's complaining, you already have changed it to layer feed. But you are going to have the feed intake that you need. Okay, hey, we have a couple. Yeah. Sorry, Shabir. There is another one related probably with uh, with this uh, uh, hybrid, uh, mm -hmm. most of the most of, what 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 are important of the prelay concept, which most of the breeding companies advise as many feed meals apply in a period of seventeen weeks and one kilogram and things like that. Uh, uh, so the idea of this feed is to replace the prelay or whatever it is done now. Uh, we know is that the prelay could be an interesting concept in the short term or in a very specific conditions, but we know that in the practical way, it's very difficult to apply. So this trial, this new concept is trying to give enough calcium to the birds at that moment that they need and the, avoid the mistakes that in the practical uh, world are happening. And from the point of view of adaptation of uh, from developer to this kind of feed, uh, when you change from low amount of calcium to high levels of calcium, the trick of this feed to avoid this kind of uh, uncertainty is to have 60% of the calcium in coarse particle. We know that the birds can select based on the grain and on the particle size. So if they don't like it, they are not going to eat it. Sorry, David. Okay. We have a question here from Dr. Sandeep uh, with 80 uh, on the uh, midnight stack. He's saying, so you suggest a liquid calcium to be used supplementation during higher needs as midnight snack. And another question is asking to please elaborate on midnight snack. And, and I guess that may be about if you could explain more about how um, that's the time when they, where if the calcium is freely available through the water, it's going to be a lot more um, quicker to be, yeah, to I mean, be used. Yeah, one of the things that we have to realize is that uh, at that moment of the time, the needs of calcium are going to be high. That's why also we are recommending to use a high part, I mean, a coarse particle in, in the feed because it's going to have a lower release of the calcium. So one thing that we have to realize is that when we make that mineral the snack, most of the birds might eat, some of them could not, but for sure, all of them, they are going to drink water. So in this way, if we are putting a source of calcium in the water, we know that at least something is going to get into the birds. So at the end, I think it's a matter of uh, improving the effect of the midnight snack together with the practices of feeding and the light that we are giving. Okay, I was uh, reading uh, through uh, more questions about oxidative stress and um, 
Uh, we have uh, uh, yeah some interest in, interest in the topic apparently. Um, uh, there are there is uh, one uh, for example how oxidative stress uh, affects uh, gut health. Well, uh, oxidative stress can occur in many tissues. Uh, the gut uh, tissue is uh, uh, of course uh, one of them. And uh, what happens there? Uh, well, of course, uh, when oxidative stress occurs, and um, the animal is uh, releasing uh, some chemical messengers. These chemical messengers uh, will, will also, uh, let's say, call on the immune system. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, will uh, provoke a series of reactions uh, that at the end uh, of uh, the effect uh, will be uh, that uh, we have less uh, surface uh, available uh, for a uh, digestion and absorption of heat. So, yes, oxidative stress will affect uh, gut health in uh, different manners. Uh, this is one of them. And of course, uh, when we have a compromised uh, gut, uh, we will uh, then uh, um, increase uh, the growth of uh, uh, potential pathogens. So this is another way in uh, which uh, oxidative stress at the end will affect gut health. And uh, uh, there's, uh, there's, there are questions uh, about uh, if uh, essential oils have strong uh, or enough uh, uh, capacity or antioxidant capacity. Well, of course, uh, that depends on what you are using and that depends uh, uh, on the quality uh, of uh, the products that you are using. Combination of products are always better because they will have more than one effect. And uh, when we are uh, targeting gut health, uh, we do not need only to target oxidative stress. Uh, we need uh, also to target uh, gut health with its complexity, which uh, I, I have to say, no product is uh, that uh, uh, silver bullet. Um, but uh, let's say the more uh, modes of action that you have, the better. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, you need uh, to target uh, uh, oxidative stress on one side, but you also need to target uh, the numbers uh, of uh, uh, potential pathogens or pathogens growing. Uh, you would need uh, probably uh, also to target endotoxins, mycotoxins, uh, and uh, the complexity uh, of uh, the gut environment. So, oxidative stress is one very important piece, not the only one. Although, it's uh, so important that it's uh, worth uh, to target it uh, with uh, uh, yeah, good solutions. Good. Uh, many other questions uh, that you would like to pick, uh, Xavier? Or... Yeah, um, there is a question here. It's asking about what is the best strategy to stimulate the egg weight? Increase the uh, sulfur uh, amino acid ratio, uh, linoleic acid. Well, from the point of view of uh, exercise, the first limiting factor that you are going to have for uh, stimulating egg weight is going to be the body weight of the pullet at the fifth week. If that period of time in one of my slides you could see at the beginning is that is the time that you are going to develop the carcass of the bird. So if you don't have a big carcass, you are not going to have a big egg. And that's not going to, I mean, and that's going to be the first limiting factor. So no matter how much we can do with the nutrition, always the limiting factor is going to be the body weight of the pullet at the fifth week. If we want to have bigger body, bigger eggs than what the guideline is recommending, we need to have a heavier pullet. And that heavier pullet starts at the fifth week. It doesn't matter if we have a heavy pullet at 17 weeks and it was low body weight at the fifth week. That, that hen that was low body weight at the fifth week and now is 100 or 200 grams above the standard at 17 weeks, she cannot lay big eggs, no matter how, met, how much methionine or whatever we want to put in the diet. Okay, once we have the right body weight at the fifth week and then we have the right body weight also at 16, 17 weeks. Once we are in the production and we want to stimulate the excise, the first thing that we have seen in this presentation is going to be the amount of amino acids available. So we have to work with uh, levels, let's say, of high levels of amino acids, proportionally, always keeping a rating. 95% of sulfur amino acid. I would say with 90, it would be enough. 
as long as I said, you have the right pullet. And then the other part is about linoleic acid. The linoleic acid is a limitant from the point of view of egg size. But what it is going to be important is that those amino acids that you are putting in the diet, they are fully available for egg production. As we have seen is the amino acids are the ones that they are going to drive the egg mass. So remember is that from energy point of view, the diet has three sources, starch, amino acids, and fat. If we have low levels of fat in the diet, the amino acids that you have put in the diet will be used for energy. So it means that those amino acids, they are not going to be used for egg mass. They are going to use for maintenance, for just normal uh, situation. So it's always more important the added fat than the level of linoleic acid. Yes, Javier, we have one here on relating to mash and particle size. Um, it's asking, uh, what is your recommendation for feed particle size in mash to prevent uh, separation at the farm? And I guess also maybe it may be related to feed intake also. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we have to realize in the mash feed, we are always going to have a delimitant factor that is going to be our fi finest particle in the feed. So we know that the premix, the fine calcium carbonate, the amino acids, most of them, they are going to be fine particle. And that one, we have to live with that. So that's going to be our limiting factor. So sometimes when we think about what is the best particle side, it's not a number, it's about uniformity of the feed. Because the point is we are going to have always that dust that's going to limit the particle size that we are chasing. So what we say is it's important that we are going to have, let's say, 25% of the feed below 0.5 millimeters, then another 25% in an S scale, and another 25% in another scale, and another 25% in another scale. What I mean is try to make the feed as uniform as possible, knowing that in the mash, you are going to go into half the limiting factor of you have a lot of dusty raw materials. So when you push for high size because they like to eat grains, you might lose uniformity. So your average looks like high, but then the birds are not eating the fines. And in the fines, we have the vitamins, the minerals, the amino acids, that they are also very important for having the birds uh, healthy and in a good productivity. So sorry, there is no magic number. It's more <laughs> about uniformity of the feed. Well, uh, we have uh, a lot of questions here. It's uh, hard to pick, uh, but um, I would like uh, to, that I lost it, yes. Um, I, would, I would like to, to uh, get a little bit into uh, the ways to increase uh, feed intake in early laying period. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, uh, I think uh, it needs uh, really to start uh, uh, with uh, the pre-lay feed or even a little bit better uh, during the rearing uh, period when we uh, may want to increase uh, the, uh, the, well, to decrease actually the nutritional density of the diet, so increasing uh, the fiber. So the animal starts uh, to consume more feed. And uh, um, of course, uh, like uh, Xavier uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, we can uh, do uh, some, let's say, more palatable uh, feed, uh, increasing uh, the solid content, uh, so the salt content uh, of, uh, of the feed. Uh, but in general, I think uh, this needs to start before. This needs uh, to, be, um, to be addressed uh, during the late uh, rearing and uh, uh, during uh, the, um, uh, the pre-lay uh, period.
Sorry, I was checking. I'm checking more questions. <laughs> we are, we are. Yes, exactly. So that's why. And, and there are the two. There are so many that you, you don't know where to lay your eyes. Huh? Yes. But uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, for all of your questions. Uh, yes. For sure, uh, they are all very interesting, and we will try to answer them all. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions I have seen here, there are some references about uh, feed intake and the FCR. Um, one of the things is in the layers, it's it's very easy to make a layer look like low FCR. It's just a matter of increasing proportionally energy and amino acids. And the diet and the layer will adapt her feed intake to that. I just always give a, an example is we have layers in in US where the corn and the soya is very cheap. And for them making a diet of a target feed intake of 100 grams is very cheap. And we have the same layer hen in Europe and the lay same layer hen, the European nutritionists, because of the pricing of the raw materials, they cannot afford to make a low, a high density diet. So they go to diets of 115 grams. And it's the same layer hen, and you can see the same good performance. They have a different FCR in Europe and in the US, but it's the same hen. So mm -hmm. it's the decision of the company. And of course, the raw material prices, what is going to make you look like a high or low FCR. But at the end of the day, what we have to remember is that what is the income over the feed cost of our birds? Because at the end is how much money it comes into our pocket once we put that money into the beaks of our layers. Okay, we probably have time for just one more question, I think, uh, we've, we've run out of time. Um, there is one here, uh, again, on the midnight snack. It's, it's asking, once we start a midnight snack, can we stop it in the same flock? Yes, we can. So it's asking, once you begin, can you stop it or do you keep going to the end? Usually the recommendation is once you use it, I mean, you are not going to have any negative advantage. Everything is going to be positive when you have a midnight snack. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Xavier and, and Marissa Bell. And uh, uh, as I say, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, and, and thank you all for attending and for your questions. You can email us for, for any further questions on our webinar topics using the address webinar at ewnutrition.com. And also we can and, uh, have a version of the presentation that we can distribute through that uh, channel. A uh, recording of this webinar will be available on our website tomorrow. In a moment, I'll launch our poll questionnaire. And also please join us next week for our third layer webinar on egg quality control by Ron Eck from Lerman Tierzucht. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.